Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the adaptive immune response and immunosuppressants. Okay, so we're in the process of looking at the adaptive immune response, and we are specifically looking at the humoral adaptive immune response at the moment. So we've seen that a professional, anti uh, sorry, a professional antigen presenting cell, such as a macrophage or a dendritic cell, will phagocytose the extracellular or humoral pathogen into a phagosome. It will then break that pathogen down, including all of its antigens, okay, and it will present fragments of the antigens on uh, its surface uh, complexed with the uh, major histocompatibility complex uh, class 2. Okay, so we are studying a specific antigen now. Of course, you will initiate the same response for all sorts of antigens and for all sorts of fragments of each antigen as well. But we're now looking at a specific antigen and we've got a specific fragment of that antigen and our antigen presenting cell has found a uh, T cell, a naive CD4 positive T cell, which happens to have a T cell receptor which is complementary to that uh, antigen fragment and therefore will bind to uh, the antigen fragment presented on MHC class 2. The CD4 on the surface of this naive CD4 positive T cell will then also interact with the MHC class 2 and together the T cell receptor with its antigen fragment and the CD4 with its MHC class 2 will provide signal 1 uh, to this uh, naive T lymphocyte. However, that will do nothing unless you also have the co-stimulatory molecules on the surface of your uh, antigen-presenting cell. And this is what distinguishes these professional antigen-presenting cells from normal cells. Normal cells cannot put these co-stimulatory molecules on and therefore are incapable of activating T cells because you need these co-stimulatory molecules. So, when... Uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns from the pathogen also activate the pattern recognition receptors on the surface of the professional antigen-presenting cell, then that will lead to the expression of new molecules such as CD40 and either B7.1 or B7.2. And CD40 will bind to CD40 ligand on the surface of the naive CD4 positive T cell, and CD Oh, sorry, B7.1 or B7.2, which are also known as CD80 and CD86, will bind to the CD28 on the surface of the uh, T lymphocyte. And this binding of CD40 to CD40 ligand, and either B7.1 or B7.2 to CD28, will deliver signal 2 to this T lymphocyte. And now something will happen. Okay, so what's going to happen is that the T lymphocyte is going to start making two key molecules, okay? So signal 1 and signal 2 will, will um, start the T lymphocyte making two molecules. And it's going to start making interleukin-2, IL-2, and it's also going to start making the interleukin-2 receptor alpha component. So, basically, this is going to work through an autocrine signaling loop. So this T cell here, this naive CD4 positive T cell, which has now received signal 1 and signal 2, is going to start producing interleukin 2 and secreting it out from its cell membrane into the surrounding space. And that interleukin 2 is going to actually act on this exact same cell again. So it secretes a molecule which is going to act on receptors on its own cell membrane. Such signaling is known as autocrine signaling, okay? When you release a molecule which is going to stimulate a receptor on your own cell membrane, that's known as autocrine. Auto means self, okay? Crine refers to signaling, so it's self-signaling. Okay, so on the surface of the T cell, you always have expressed two of the three portions of an interleukin-2 receptor. So the interleukin-2 receptor is a um, trimer, basically. It needs three subunits. Now, you always make the interleukin-2 receptor beta component, okay, which is this middle one that I'm drawing here. 
Oh, sorry, it's, there's not one in the middle. I'm imagining that the alpha one's already there, but it's not. Sorry about that. So it's this blue one here now. Okay, so that's the interleukin-2 receptor beta. And then you also always have expressed the interleukin-2 receptor gamma component, which is now in green here. Okay, so in green, this is the interleukin-2 receptor gamma. However, to make this actually functional, you need the final component, the interleukin-2 receptor alpha. And normally, on the surface of these uh, T lymphocytes, you do not repeat, you do not have the interleukin-2 receptor alpha. So what this T lymphocyte will do upon receiving signal 1 and signal 2 is it will firstly produce interleukin-2, which will go out uh, into the extracellular space and is going to try and work on interleukin-2 receptors on the surface of this naive CD4 positive T lymphocyte. However, at the moment there are no functional interleukin-2 receptors, so you also have to make the alpha component here. So when you make this alpha component, then it will join in with the other two and form a now functional interleukin-2 receptor. Okay, so here is the interleukin-2 receptor, and now interleukin-2 is going to act on the interleukin-2 receptor here. So this is the interleukin-2 receptor, and it's going to trigger uh, the signal free within the uh, T lymphocyte. So this is going to cause what's known as signal free. And now what's going to happen is that uh, CD4 positive naive T lymphocyte is going to differentiate. Okay, so let me show this on the next page. So I'll get some more paper and show you this. Okay, so what's going to happen is you're, you've started off with this CD4 positive naive T lymphocyte and remember we chose it because it had a T cell receptor that was complementary to the uh, antigen fragment that we were presenting. Okay, so this is a CD4 positive naive T cell. Okay, and at the present you've only got one of these CD4 positive naive T cells. What's going to happen once it receives signal free is it's firstly going to differentiate, okay? and it's going to differentiate into a type of cell known as a T helper naught cell. Okay, so this is a T helper and then it's a zero cell. Okay, and this is often abbreviated to T and then subscript H for helper and then you put the number afterwards which is zero. And this process of turning from a naive CD4 positive T cell into a T helper naught cell is differentiation, and it's the first process that receiving signal free will uh, produce. Okay, then what will happen is you will divide and divide and divide and produce an entire population of identical T helper naught cells, which all have this T cell receptor, which is targeted against this specific antigen fragment that has been presented to us. Okay, so we're going to get a whole population of T helper naught cells. And I'm only drawing three, but in reality you'll get thousands, if not millions of these. So proliferation is going to follow. Okay, so now in the lymph node we have a small colony of these identical T helper naught cells. Okay, now what happens next is a little bit mysterious. In the humoral immune response, these are going to differentiate into what are known as T helper 2 cells. So let me put these in here. So they're going to turn into T helper 2 cells rather than T helper 1 cells. Okay, so there are many different types of T helper cells. More are coming out all the time. There are T helper 17s, uh, T regs as well. But the main two that you need to know about are T helper 2 cells and T helper 1 cells. Okay, and in the humoral immune response, these T helper naught cells are mainly going to differentiate into T helper 2 cells. Okay, a few of them might differentiate into T helper 1 cells, but it's mainly going to favor T helper 2 cells. We'll see T helper 1 cells later in a cell-mediated immune response. Okay, now what seems to drive these T helper naught cells to become T helper 2 cells is 
interleukin-4, but we do not understand where this interleukin-4 comes from. We do not understand what secretes the interleukin-4, because actually T-helper-2 cells end up secreting interleukin-4, but they haven't been made yet. So what initially um, produces this interleukin-4? Because this seems to symbolize that the infection that we are dealing with is an extracellular humoral infection and therefore requires T helper naught cells to differentiate into T helper 2 cells because these T helper 2 cells are going to be extremely important in producing the humoral immune response. So somehow the fact that the pathogen is extracellular causes a rise in interleukin-4 within the blood and therefore all well within the interstitial fluid of the infection um, and therefore it ends up being transferred to the lymph node because of course uh, the interleukin-4 will go through the lymph into the lymph node and therefore um, will be around these T helper naught um, cells okay but we don't know what actually releases that interleukin-4 and how it decides that the pathogen is an extracellular pathogen and therefore requires uh, interleukin-4 to be released and therefore stimulate the T-helper-0 cells to become T-helper-2 cells. However, something seems to release this interleukin-4 in response to somehow realizing that this pathogen is extracellular and that interleukin-4 causes these T-helper-0 cells to uh, differentiate into T helper 2 cells. Okay, now to understand what the T helper 2 cells are going to do, we need to turn our attention temporarily away from T lymphocytes and towards B lymphocytes. Okay, so we discussed that the B lymphocytes sit within these B cell follicles that are within the cortex of the lymph nodes. Okay, now B lymphocytes are slightly more simple than T lymphocytes in that you don't have these two separate populations of CD4 positive and CD8 positive T lymphocytes. A B lymphocyte is a B lymphocyte, okay? So let's have this as our B cell. And again, it has a massive great nucleus compared to uh, the rest of its cytoplasm. And that's because its cytoplasm is tiny, because it's not active. It sits and sits and sits and does nothing, basically. So it doesn't need any cytoplasm. Now, in these B cell follicles, you will have a massive great number of B cells. And the B cells will not all be identical and they differ in that their B cell receptor is a targeted against a different antigen so let's now discuss the B cell receptor okay so they have a small B cell receptor which is basically just like an antibody but it's mounted on the membrane so it's a modified antibody that allows it to be integrated into uh, the phospholipid bilayer. So it has this structure where we have these two heavy chains, okay, this characteristic Y structure here, where we have these two heavy chains, which are in orange here, okay, uh, and those are connected by a disulfide bond between the two. So this is one heavy chain, and this is another heavy chain here. And then each of the heavy chains then has attached to it a light chain. So here in pink, these are the light chains. So we then have two light chains. Okay, now most of the antibody or the B cell receptor is a fixed structure. So it's uh, the same for absolutely every single B cell. Okay, however, the um, top bit up here differs basically. This is very, very variable. And this is the portion which is going to bind to an antigen. Okay, so this is the B cell receptor. And it's basically the same as an antibody, except that it has a slight modification down here in the fixed region that allows it to be inserted into the plasma membrane. So this is the B cell receptor, which is often abbreviated to BCR for short. So, in the lymph node, in the B cell follicles, you have a huge number of B cells, and all of them will have slightly different B cell receptors. So these regions up here of the uh, B cell receptor, this variable region up here, this will bind to a slightly different molecule, basically. And they're going to bind to uh, antigens from pathogens. So, 
back to our site of infection. Okay, so we have this pathogen that's invading in this site of infection. And basically, it had this antigen, which we were assuming was um, a cell surface antigen, or it could have been a toxin that was secreted. Now, if it's a toxin which is secreted, then it's very easy to understand how the B cells are going to get to see that antigen because the microbe will secrete the toxin into uh, the interstitial space. It will then go into the lymphatic vessels and be uh, moved up to the lymph nodes and then it will have to percolate through the lymph node, um, through all of the lymph lymphocytes to get to this medullary sinus in here so it will go past all of the B lymphocytes in here so they can all have a good go at binding to it basically and an important thing to note is that B cell receptors unlike T cell receptors bind to the intact antigen rather than an antigen fragment okay so these are going to bind to intact antigens so that's an easy way to understand how these B cells are going to be exposed to intact antigens if the antigen is a secretive product. It's a little bit more difficult to understand how it's going to be exposed to it if it's on the surface of a pathogen. But what you have to remember is over here at the site of infection, you'll have the microbe and it will be continuously being phagocytosed by another type of phagocyte. Okay, so a major player in the acute inflammatory response are neutrophils, okay, which have this characteristic multilobe nucleus here. Okay, so in the acute inflammatory response, we absolutely love these guys. We um, recruit them hugely. We bring a huge number of these neutrophils into uh, the site of um, disturbance, okay? And they are a phagocyte, so they will engulf the microbe, engulf the pathogen, and then break it down. However, they do a less good job than macrophages and dendritic cells. They uh, do it in a sort of half-hearted way, and they end up chucking loads of intact antigens out, basically, into the interstitial fluid. Now, this actually is very helpful because these antigens that the neutrophil is chucking out, which are still intact uh, from the microbe, okay, that has been broken down within the neutrophil, these can go into um, the lymphatic vessels and they will drift up towards the lymph node and that's how these B lymphocytes will be exposed to surface antigens on the surface of uh, pathogens, okay? Um, and the pathogen will be broken down, the surface antigens will be removed and then chucked out by the neutrophil and then they'll go into these uh, afferent lymphatic vessels which will take them to the B the cells. Okay, so whether we're talking about a surface antigen or whether we're talking about a secreted toxin antigen, they will be um, percolating amongst these B cells. Now, it might just so happen that one of these antigen molecules just happens to come across a B cell which has a B cell receptor that uh, binds to it. So let's say this is the same antigen that we've mounted the T cell response against. So all of these T helper 2 cells, they are armed against a fragment of this antigen here, whether it was a cell surface antigen or a toxin antigen. Of course, we did the... Um, T cell activation pathway for a surface antigen simply because it was easier to draw, but it could have been a secreted toxin. All that would have happened is that the um, the phagocyte, the, the initial antigen presenting cell, the dendritic cell or the macrophage, it would have phagocytosed the toxin rather than the whole microbe, broken down that toxin and exposed uh, a fragment of it on its surface and then gone through the exact same activation process. Okay, so whether it's a surface antigen or just a secreted toxin, it's now bound to this B cell, uh, B cell receptor. And what is going to happen next? Well, basically, what happens once the B cell receptor has bound to an antigen, and I'm going to color that antigen in blue, is that the B cell endocytoses this B cell receptor into a vesicle, okay? And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.